بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بار الخلائق يجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيدي المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين المنتخبين المنتجبين الذين كلامهم نور وأمرهم رجد ووصيتهم التقوى وفعلهم الخير وعادتهم الإحسان وسجيتهم الكرم لا سيما على الحسين المذلوم المقتول المجروح الأدشان المذبوح من القفا في يوم عاشوراء في أرض كربلا بلا جرم ولا خطأ الذي غسله دم وكفنه رمال كربلا مقطع الأعضاء مسلوب العمامة والرداء يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لتدخلن المسجد الحرام إن شاء الله آمنين صدق الله العلي العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the verse that I have quoted to the Prophet of Islam Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In reaction to something that takes place in relation to what is later then known as Umratul Qadha. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the dream that the Prophet of Islam has seen is a true one. You shall verily and surely enter into Masjid al-Haram in a state that you are all in safety and you will either be shaving your heads as they do after ihram or cutting your hair. Analyzing this verse of the Holy Quran as we understand the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when he migrates to Medina to al-Munawwara it is only after several years that he's then allowed to re-enter into Mecca. I want to look at what is being referred to here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you shall surely enter whilst you will be safe. What was the historical discussions and the tafsir discussions that the scholars had about this verse? And how does this verse directly relate to me and you today? For as we understand, the Prophet of Islam wishes to go back to his hometown and Watan, to go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to perform Umrah and Hajj. But after the migration from Mecca to Al-Mukarrama to Medina, it becomes very difficult for a number of reasons, the most important of which is danger of life. 
that the Muslimin are unable to travel and go to Mecca because their life is in danger from the Quraysh. We're told that on one occasion the Prophet of Islam sees a dream. And here we have a discussion that the scholars have and a hadith mention of the different types of dreams that a person would see. For sometimes I see a dream, me and you, that has no meaning. Sometimes I see something where shaitan is playing with my mind or what the narration is called la'bu shaitan. Sometimes I see a nightmare. Sometimes I see something, I'm performing something haram. Sometimes I see something dangerous. This is often shaitan playing with my mind. Sometimes the dreams that me and you see are classified as true dreams. There may be someone today here that saw something in their dream that actualized in their life and they saw it in reality. We sometimes have these type of dreams. However, as for the Prophet of Islam, the dreams that he see aren't like our dreams. That some have meaning, some know the billah are shaitan playing with the mind. No, the dreams that the Prophet of Islam sees are in the form of wahi and revelation. As you've heard, for example, Nabi Ibrahim would sometimes gain wahi from dreams. Likewise, the Prophet of Islam. And so he sees a dream within which him and the Muslims are finally entering into Mecca al and performing Umrah. When the Prophet of Islam wakes up, he comes to the masjid. He informs the people that we, inshallah, shall enter into Mecca al without fear of our life. Will be, uh, we will have safety and we'll perform Umrah. So when this was said to the people, what did they assume? It's as if I said to you, on Ashura it will rain. What would you assume I'm talking about? You'd say the Ashura of this year. If I said on Ashura it will rain, you think I'm speaking about this year. And so when then the Muslimin left Medina Tul Munawwara with the intention of entering into Mecca, and they got to the outskirts of Mecca until finally they realized that the situation is too dangerous for us to enter. And they were made to return back to Medina Tul Munawwara. This is when they questioned what the Prophet of Islam had told them. But the Prophet of Islam said, we will enter, we will be safe, we will perform Umrah. We have just tried to embark on that journey. We came on the outskirts of Mecca and we were sent back due to the dangerous situation that was present. And so some of them began to doubt the Prophet of Islam. It's as if I said to you, Ashura, it will rain, and it didn't rain. And I came to you and I said, no, no, I meant next year. Or next year it didn't rain, I said, no, I meant in five years it will rain on Ashura. You see, this guy is making up stories. So na'udhu billah, some of them, they came to the Prophet, they said, Ya Rasulullah, you said to us that we will enter Masjid al-Haram and perform Umrah. We went to the outskirts. We were made to return. What happened about that dream of yours? So the Prophet of Islam said, I said we will enter. When did I say we will enter this year? We will enter Masjid al-Haram and perform Umrah. But that is next year, not this year. And so straight away, some from the group of the Muslimin that were present began to doubt the Prophet of Islam. Is what he is saying true or is he now the billah making up stories? Others, however, were firm in their belief that what the Prophet of Islam has said is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is when that this verse was revealed. What the Prophet has seen is truth. You shall verily and surely enter into Masjid al-Aram. However, next year in the form that you will be doing Umrah and you will be safe. If this has been understood, there are a number of things from this event of history that the Mufassireen have mentioned that are of interest to me and you. The first of these is that often a person assumes something about religion and takes that to be faith set in stone. And then when they are confronted with this not being the truth, it becomes very difficult for them to accept that. What do I mean? These people, when they heard you will enter into Masjid al-Haram, they assumed that it was this year. The Prophet of Islam never said that. They assumed that it was this year. They took that to be gospel. They took that to be part of their faith. And so then when someone comes to them and tells them, no, it's next year, it becomes very difficult for them now to accept 
And this is often the state of me and you also. We assume things about the religion. We assume things that we've heard. Then when we're told otherwise, we find it difficult to accept. Why? Because I, with my own whims and my own nerves, have interpreted something that wasn't present in the first place. Let me give you an example. For example, you hear a lot when it comes to khums, the issue of khums, people say, it's my money. And so I should be able to determine where my money is spent. You have assumed something here. When did Quran al Karim say that that one fifth belongs to you? You think that you own 100% and one fifth you have to give from your own money? Read Quran al Karim. Quran al Karim says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, wa'lam wa anna ma ghanim tum min shayin fa anna lillahi khumusa. From the beginning that belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It never belonged to you. So I can't say it's my money. I should determine where it's spent. From the beginning it belonged to the imam. From the beginning it belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I assumed something. Now it's difficult for me to hear the truth. Likewise, another example. We often hear that if a person performs the ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi And then a number of narrations are there from the Holy Prophet of Islam. This equals the number of Hajj. Again, someone assumed and said, how can this be correct? Because Hajj is something which is wajib. Whereas Ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada, according to most scholars, some said it was wajib, but according to most, is very highly mustahab. And so some came and said, these riwayat can't be true. How can something which is mustahab have much greater reward than something that is wajib? Again, I say take lesson from this verse. Don't assume something that you have no proof of. Don't use your own whims to understand religion. Who said wajib and mustahab was related to reward and thawab? Wajib and mustahab has no link to how much thawab is present. Why? I entered into this room and I said to someone, Salamun alaykum. It's mustahab for me to initiate the salam. It's wajib for them to respond. You've all heard of those narrations that a person that initiates the salam, his reward is 99. The person that responds, methalan, his reward is 1. Responding is wajib. Initiating is mustahab. The mustahab had 99 in, in uh, opposition to the wajib that only had 1. So it's not, it's possible that something is mustahab and it has much greater reward than that which is wajib. Often we assume things, then we find it difficult when we hear the haqq like these people. And so this was the first thing that the scholars of Quran mentioned. They assumed that they would enter into Masjid al-Haram. This year, the Prophet of Islam says next year. Then the scholars, they take the discussion further and say without a doubt, this event in history, known as Umrah al-Qadha, was one of the greatest examples for me and you to understand the reality of faith and Iman. Why? Because of the Muslimin, there were those that when the Prophet of Islam said no, I meant next year, began to doubt the Prophet. And they later on, Madhalan, became Munafiqeen, or they were already Munafiqeen. But there were those that understood that true faith is for me to believe in something even if I haven't seen it with my own eyes. If a ma'asum and an infallible has told me, or if Quran al Karim presents something in front of me, true faith is I can accept it without having seen it. And that's why the faith that you have is different to the faith of the people that lived during the time of the Prophet. Why? For it was easy for them to believe in someone that they have seen with their own eyes. They saw the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They saw what would happen to him when revelation would reveal. Then they believed. You haven't seen the Prophet of Islam. You haven't seen Amir al muminin Sayyid al-Shuhada. Yet still you believed. Therefore your belief has a different type of quality. Other than the belief of those that saw first. Then they believed. True belief is this, I don't need to see with my own eyes. If the Prophet of Islam tells me not this year, next year, even though it seems that we should have performed the Umrah on this occasion, I haven't seen it with my own eyes, I believe. 
And we find a number of narrations in this regard that speak about the human being and the mu'min believing in that which is hidden from their eyes. For example, in one of the narrations, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam He comes and says, if a person doesn't believe in these things, laysa minna, he is not from us. If he doesn't believe in the questioning of the grave, if he doesn't believe in Jannah and Jahannam being created, if he doesn't believe in Shafa'a and intercession, if he doesn't believe in Mi'raj of the Prophet of Islam. If you don't believe in these things, you're not from us. All of these things are such that I cannot see them and I won't be able to see them with my own eyes. A big part of faith was this. If I'm told to believe in something by a ma'soom, I believe in it. And here we understand that when me and you believe and have iman in that which we haven't seen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you the result of your iman in this world first before seeing it in the akhirah. When you had strong belief in something that you haven't seen, none of you were present on Ashura, I wasn't present in Karbala, yet we believed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already shown you the fruits. You don't even realize. Later on you'll realize what Allah gifted me due to this belief. And I'll give you one example. In Najif al-Ashraf, there is a scholar by the name of Mirza Naini. Mirza Naini was one of the great scholars that lived there. And he's buried inside the shrine of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salatu wasalam. Mirza Naini had a teacher who originally was from Isfahan, who was also then moved to Najaf and for some time also lived and studied and taught in Samarra by the name of Sayyid Muhammad Fisharaki. So Sayyid Muhammad Fisharaki is the teacher of Mirza Naini. And Sayyid Muhammad Fisharaki dies before Mirza Naini, he's much older than him. Mirza Naini wishes to see what his state was in the next life. Sayyid Fisharaki, he's a mujtahid, he's a Ayatollah. He spent his years looking at narrations of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wasalam. He would read how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of the family of someone after that person has left. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives ease to the believer as they're leaving this world. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings rizq to the alim without him having to go anywhere searching for his rizq. Everyone else has to search. Allah says, the alim, I place rizq at his doorstep. So Sayyid Fisharaki, he reads all of these things. And he tells his family and children, his situation was very bad. But he would tell his wife, look, what I'm doing I'm doing for the school of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. This fiqh that I'm training people in, this is their fiqh. They will take care of us. And he would have this belief, however, he hasn't seen how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of his family after he's gone. He hasn't seen how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps the believer even before they leave this world. But what did I say? If you have belief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you the fruits of that belief in this world. So Sayyid Fisharaki dies, Mirza Naini says, I wish to know what his state was after he died and what is the state of his family. I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow me to see him in my dream, Sayyid Fisharaki, if possible. As we know, when a person goes to the barzakh, depending on how close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are, some are able to visit their family members every single day. Some are able to visit from Barzakh. Their family members in the world, for example, once a week. Some are able to come into the dreams of their family members. So it depends on a person's station and how close they are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyid Fisharaki eventually comes in the dream of Mirza Naini. Mirza Naini sees his teacher. He says, I asked him, what took place with you when you died? You had all this belief that Allah will take care of you and your family. What happened? So first Sayyid Fishariki doesn't say anything, he turns his face. Mirza Naini says, in my dream, again I went to him and approached him, I said, what happened to you? Again he turned. A third time when I asked, and he's about to go, I held on to his hand. And Sayyid Fishariki looked at me and said, some things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow us to tell you. 
In the barzakh, I'm not allowed to do what I want. If Allah wishes for me to tell you, I'll do so. When I asked the third time, then it seems Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to tell his student Mirza Naini what took place. And this dream, as I said, is an example of a true dream, as you'll see. So I asked him what took place. He says, look, as I was about to leave this world, I had two big problems. But I had faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, you're a mu'min, you have belief, this belief will pay off. My first issue is that there are certain shops here in Najaf al-Ashraf, there is a baker, مثلاً. and I would often buy bread from him, but I don't have money, so I would take a loan. I owe him, for example, every single day, uh, week I used to take a small loan. I owe him, for example, six dinar. A dane, a loan on my shoulders, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask me. So this was one thing that I was worried about. The second is whilst I was alive, my family were patient. Yes, we don't have money, but Sayyid is in our house. He's the teacher. He has so many students. There's barakah. Now that I'm gone, who's going to feed my wife and children, my daughters? They need to get married. Who's going to take care of them? So I had these difficulties on my shoulders, but I realized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall answer whatever request I have. He said, Malakul Maut came to me. When Malik al Maut came closer to me, I found it more difficult due to these two reasons. When suddenly I heard a call. I couldn't see who has mentioned this call. But the call was, Ya Fisharaki, for the sake of the 14 Ma'sumin that you served in this life, Allah has made everything easy for you. So when I heard this, I saw my condition has changed. Those two worries that I had, all of a sudden they've disappeared. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then took my soul and I entered into Barzakh. The dream finishes. Mirza, Mirza Naini now wishes to see what was it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just before I said in this world you will see it. The effects of your iman before you leave the, into the next world. So Mirza Naini wishes to see what exactly has happened. So first he goes to that shop and that baker who lives opposite Sayyid Fisharaki. He says I went there. I asked him, I said, did you know that there was a funeral a few days ago of this Sayyid? He says, how can I not know? All of Najaf is covered in black, shops are closed. Everyone was mourning because he's passed away. So I said, I asked him, did you do anything? He said, yes. When his coffin and the tashit was going past our shop, out of respect, I stood outside of the shop to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And as I did so, I began to think, this Sayyid owes me six dirham. At that moment in time, I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive this six dirham, I have written it off. So Samir Zanai says, this was the first thing that he had, the first worry that he had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solved it like this. This is about the other issue. His children, his wife, the daughters want to get married, they have a lifetime ahead of them. He says, I went and asked the wife of Sayyid Fisharaki, what is your situation after your father has passed away? So she says, there are no complaints. Why? So the wife and the daughter say, because a few days after the Sayyid passed away, there was a businessman who came from Isfahan. He knocked on our door. He said, where is Sayyid? We told him that Sayyid has passed away. He said, this was a gift I bought with the intention of gifting it to him and his family. Neither was it sadaqah, nor was it khums, nor was it zakat. Just as a gift for him and his expenses, the wife of Sayyid says, this is enough for us until the day that we die. In the way that this verse told us, there were those that believed in the Prophet of Islam. Without having seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed them the effects of the belief in this dunya. Likewise, me and you, the more you believe in what a ma'soom tells you. The more you believe in what Quran and Kareem has presented in this world, you shall see the effects before you go to the next. If this discussion has been understood, the third question then that comes about the verse is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet of Islam, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. You will enter Masjid al-Haram insha'Allah. If Allah wishes, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say insha'Allah? Allah is telling the Prophet of Islam, you will enter into Masjid al-Haram if Allah wishes. Insha'Allah is something that me and you say. 
When has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed something to the Prophet and then put insha'Allah? So the Mufassireen had this discussion as to why Allah would say you will enter if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes. One answer that was given was a simple answer. Which is what? Which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to teach me and you that in everything that you do, ensure that you place that insha'Allah and understand the will of Allah azza wa jal. For often you hear people say, I did this, I opened this business, I sent this person to study, I was able to do this, I wish to do this. When in actual fact, the smallest task becomes impossible if it isn't for the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so one thing was reminding me and you that everything you do, the will of Allah azza wa jal is part of it. Don't forget this. The scholars here, they give an example. They say, look, there's a train driver. He sits in his train. And he begins to drive the train. That train driver has the right, has his own will. When he wishes to stop, the train stops. When he wishes for it to go faster, it will go faster. When he wishes it for, uh, for it to go right or left, he has fun, full control. However, if that electricity that is in the tracks turns off, can he do anything? Not at all. So this is the example of the human being and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have my own will. When I wish to do something, I can do it. I wish to eat. I wish to come and sit in the majlis. I wish to not come in the majlis. All of this is part of my will. But in the way that you turn off that electricity, he can't do anything. Everything revolves around the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the first answer to the question. The second answer that we were given, however, as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Insha'Allah, if Allah wishes, is that the group of Muslimin that were being told here, surely you will enter, believe, you will perform the Umrah. There were some from that group that weren't given enough life to see that Umrah with their own eyes. And so when Allah said, Insha'Allah, He was referring to this fact that some of you, your lifespan is going to finish. You won't be able to be with the Prophet of Islam at that time, lest we can say you shall enter into Masjid al-Haram. And so this was an indication to something else very important in my life. And that is that something that shaitan does to me and you is he makes me believe that I will live forever. How many times have you heard it or you've said it yourself? When I'm th of this age, I'll do this. When I become older, I'll do this. Who said we'll live? You know, people ask me, where are you in Muharram in this year? How do I know if I will live? How do I know if tomorrow I'll come to this majlis? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he said, inshallah, was reminding me and you every single moment, be aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have written my life to end at this moment. And an example given by the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, is a very beautiful example. Imagine you have an item of clothing, this Aba, for example. This Aba is completely ripped from the middle. The only thing that remains is one thread at the top, keeping the right and the left side of the Aba together. So there's a complete rip. There's one thread that remains. If this thread is to go, the whole Aba will fall. And I won't be able to wear it. The Prophet of Islam says the example of the dunya is like this garment. Why? Because when I place that Aba on my shoulders, what's in the back of my mind? Any moment now the thread will go. Any moment it will rip. How much uncertain is that me placing the Aba that only has one thread? Either it will go today or it will go tomorrow. He says this is the example of your dunya. Shaitan tells you you'll live for a long time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inshallah you live. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says always have that at the back of your mind that at any time he can take my soul and I return to my Lord. Shaykh al-Baha'i in this regard he gives an example. He mentions that Nabi Isa alayhi salatu was salam on one occasion is traveling. And Nabi Isa sees a worshipper. And this worshipper has lives, it seems, on the top of a mountain. And this worshipper spends his days and nights in sujood and ibadah and worship. So Isa alayhi salatu was salam would see him and see 
that he spends his days and nights here. There's no house there. There's no shelter there that he's built for himself. The sun is directly falling on his face. So on one occasion, Nabi Isa says, I went up this mountain. And I went to this worshipper. And I said, I see that you live here. Is that correct? He said, yes. What do you do? He says, I worship my Lord. So Nabi Isa says, if this is the place of residence that you have chosen for yourself, build a house, have some sort of shelter. Why don't you do this? So look at his answer. Build a shelter, build a house for yourself. He says, Ya Ruh Allah, Ya Isa. A few years ago, I was blessed to visit or meet one of the prophets of God. When I met that prophet of God, he told me that my lifespan will be better than 500 years. We have this idea that especially from the time of Adam onwards, the lifespan was very long. Nuh, you have heard, for example, has lived 900 years. So this person who lives during that time, he says, I was told that methylene, my lifespan is 500 years. I thought for 500 years, is it worth it? That I spend all of this time building a house, furnishing the house, placing the roof, when it's basically tomorrow that I'm leaving this world. I thought it's better that I stay here doing ibadah than spending the few years that I have doing these things. So Nabi Isa والسلام, says, should I tell you something? The last prophet of God, when he comes, the maximum lifespan that they would have is about 100 years. But do you know how many of those 100 years they spent in these type of things? Does that mean I'm telling you don't build a house and live like that person? No. The idea is to understand at the back of my mind, I should realize, at any time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take this soul of mine. That is why Allah azza wa jal says, inshallah. Taking the discussion further then, the scholars say that one of the reasons why this took place, that first the Muslimin are told by the Prophet of Islam, you will enter into Masjid al-Haram and perform Umrah. Then they get so close to entering. They desire to see the house of God. They desire to visit Baytullah. So close and then there's a delay for one more year. The reason or one of the reasons why this took place is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to tell me and you that a person cannot be a believer until their patience is tested. For you'll be tested in many ways, but that which you'll be tested by the most is the sabr. And a mu'min gets closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on the sabr and the patience that they have. In fact, when you look at Anbiya, what was one of the qualities in the prophets of God that they were made prophets of God? Why was it that Sayyidul Shuhada was Sayyidul Shuhada? One of those factors we're told is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only tests your patience the most, He raises up a person more when they have more sabr compared to someone else. We have in the narrations a number of prophets of God before they announce their prophethood would work as shepherds for this very reason. For example, you have Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. One example is Musa al kali Musa alayhi salatu wasalam has a flock of sheep and he takes care of them in the countryside. Before all of these issues take place with Fir'aun, he's in the countryside with sheep. On one occasion, one of these sheep in the flock runs away. He sees with his own eyes this sheep is running. The narration says Musa alayhi salatu wasalam runs after it. The sheep is so far and is so fast that by the time he is able to catch it, the sun sets and it, it sends the sun sets and it is night time. So for a few hours he's running after it. Why does he run after it? Because if I was to leave this sheep to run wherever it wished to, a wolf would come and eat it. Not because I'm going to lose money, but for this own sheep, if I let it wander, a wolf will come and devour it. So for a few hours he's running, he's running, he's running until he grabs the sheep and the narration says he hugs the sheep. And he begins to dust away the dirt that has come on to the head and the body of the sheep. And he says to the sheep, you didn't have mercy on me. You made the shepherd run for a few hours. But why then did you do zulm on yourself? You became so tired, you ran. I'm here to save you, I'm here to protect you. 
And so he's taking care of the sheep, he's showing love to the sheep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then addresses the angels. If it was someone else, why do I run for two hours? Let that sheep die. Is it worth it? I'd rather lose that money than do all of this. No anger, complete patience. At that moment in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the angels and says, this is the reason why I made him a prophet of God. This is why he was worthy for me to speak to him because he was of the most patient servants of mine that have existed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he tested the Muslimin here, he tested their patience to show me and you those closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who are able to have sabr more than others around them. If that has been understood, we're told then, in the seventh year after Hijrah, the Prophet of Islam with the Muslimin finally enter into Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. And when they enter and they're in the state of Ihram, the Quraysh decide to go on top of certain mountains to see exactly what the Muslimin are doing. Books of history tell us that the Muslimin are only given three days to perform your manasik. This was called Umratul Qadha. Why Umratul Qadha? It was the Qadha of last year which we were unable to perform. And so as they're performing the manasik, and the Prophet of Islam is doing tawaf and sa'i, the Quraysh were told suddenly tell women and children, no one is allowed to leave their house. Why? The Prophet of Islam is not going to harm anyone. He's in the haram of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where bloodshed is not acceptable. Why then? So look at the answer that is given in the books of history. The reason why Quraysh told their family members no one is allowed to leave their house because they said if they see what we are seeing, Tawheed may enter into their hearts. If they see the Prophet of Islam and the Muslims doing Sa'i and Tawaf and praying Salah, one of the effects of just seeing someone worshipping sincerely is some of that sincerity may enter into my heart. And that's why it's easy for me to listen to a majlis online when I come here by physically seeing someone else also worship. This has an effect that will enter into my heart also. Just seeing certain things has an effect even if a person is a sinner. They said no one is allowed to even look at them for if they look at them they may accept his message. And the Prophet of Islam then stays there for three days. A very similar thing is found also in Ashura. For we're told in the books of Maqtal when Aba Abdullah al Hussein is in his last moments performing sajda, Umar bin Sa'ad and his people said, Don't look at the face of Hussein. Why? For the same reason. That there is so much nur on the face of Sayyid al Shuhada that by seeing him they may realize that he is on the haqq. If all of these discussions about the verse have been understood, I said, that this verse, surely you shall enter into Masjid al-Haram with safety, has a direct relationship to me and you. Why? For this verse is as if a mirror image for what takes place with the believers when it comes to Sahib al-Asri wa-Zaman. Ajrillahu ta'ala farajuhu al-Sharif. Why? For I said that those that assumed something from the religion, it became then very difficult for them to accept what the Prophet of Islam is telling them. Likewise, those that assume from their religion, when Sahib Zaman comes and tells them that which you were believing and assuming is incorrect, that which you thought was right is not true, it will become very difficult for them to accept the son of Zahra in front of them. And the way that you rejected the Prophet of Islam due to your own whims and assumptions, this will also be the state of certain people when the dhuhr comes. Likewise, I said, the greatest believers with the Prophet of Islam were those that believed in what is going to take place without having seen it with their own eyes. Kadhalik. The greatest believers in Ghaybah are those that believe in a time that yes, the flag and standard of adala and justice will be brought onto this world. I haven't seen it. But the more I believe, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises my states. And I said that these people were tested for their patience. Likewise, the believer during the time of ghaybah is tested most from their patience. For we're told that a, a group of believers may come and say, the dhuhr is very near. There's injustice in this world. 
All of a sudden they see that the Imam hasn't reappeared. This was a test of their patience. Again it comes that the Uhur is very close. Can I see that the Imam hasn't uh, appeared? There's certain signs that we read about. I see these signs being actualized. Again he didn't appear. So in the way that with the Prophet of Islam there were those that disbelieved and said once it was delayed once. This is proof that Na'udhu Billah what the Prophet of Islam said was untrue. The same is the state of certain people in Akhir zaman That once they see that the Zuhur hasn't taken place, they begin to doubt the existence of the son of Zahra salam. And so this was a mirror image of what takes place with the believers in regards to the promise of the Zuhur of the 12th Savior. If all of these discussions have been understood, I also saw another similarity. Which is what? Which is that, Ya Rasulullah, you saw a dream where you were promised to enter into Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. Likewise, there was another dream, but in relation to Sayyid al-Shuhada, where he was promised that he will enter into Karbala. For we're told that Amir al muminin passes by Karbala on his way back from Sifin. He's with Ibn Abbas. He tells Ibn Abbas, he says, do you know which land this is? Ibn Abbas says, no, Ya Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib says, if you knew which land it was, you wouldn't pass through it except that you would cry. Amir al muminin alayhi salatu wasalam then falls asleep. When his eyes opens, he tells Ibn Abbas, in my dream I saw this area of Karbala covered in blood. And I saw spears and I saw the head of my son Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. He would touch the ground and he would say, Sabran ya Aba Abdullah. Ya Rasulullah, you were promised that you, were, you would enter into Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. Likewise, Hussein was promised by the Prophet and Amir al -Mu'mineen. A time will come, you will enter into the city known as Karbala. But Ya Rasulullah, Allah says when you enter into Mecca, you will be safe. Hussein, when he entered into Karbala with his women and children, wasn't safe. On a night like this, the caravan of Sayyid al-Shuhada enters into Karbala. There is a narration mentioned in Khisal of Shaykh al-Saduq speaking about what individuals in history have cried more than anyone has ever cried. For we're told after Karbala, Zayn al-Abideen would often visit Najaf and Karbala and see and remember what took place with his father. It's okay for us to hear the tragedy, to see the tragedy with your own eyes, to live for 35, 40 years after the tragedy. On a night like this, Zayn al Abidin also enters into Karbala. The narration says there are certain people that have cried more than anyone has cried before. And Imam al Baqir says these individuals are known as Bakka'un, those that would cry a lot. Who are these Bakka'un? He says, of those that would cry profusely was Adam when he would lose Habil. For Adam would cry for 40 days and 40 nights when eventually Jibra'il would come down and say, Adam, why do you cry? He would say, I cry for the loss of my youth. Youthful son Jibra'il would say, Yes, you have lost your youthful son, but shall I tell you of how Hussein will lose Ali Unayl Akbar on the tenth of Muharram? And when he would hear the musibah of Akbar, then Adam would stop crying. The second from Bakkaun was Yaqub when he was separated from Yusuf wa 
and he became blind crying the third from Bakkaun was Yusuf who would cry in the prisons Imam Al-Baqir says and the fourth from Bakkaun was that individual that would place one hand on the wall and the other on her broken ribs saying Zahra would say Subbat alayya masaibun Law allahum Subbat ala al-ayyam Sirna layaliya For Zahra cried a lot after Rasulullah And he says the fifth from Bakkaun Was my father Zainul Abideen That whenever water was placed in front of him He remembers Abba Abdullah Say to Sajjadis with Abba Abdullah when they enter into Karbala. But first, Hussein has to give farewell to Rasulullah. For as he is about to leave Medina, he goes to the grave of Rasulullah. He says, Hadha Jaddi Rasulullah. And crying, Hussein falls unconscious. In his dream, he sees Rasulullah. He says, Ya Rasul. Allah, take me with you. Do not send me back to these people. Rasulullah would say, Habibi, ya Hussein, Noor Aini, ya Hussein, in Allah, ya Shah, and ya Raka, ya Katila. Allah wishes for you to be killed. Hussein would say, Say, and what about Zainab and Um Kulth? And what about my children? <laughs> Rasulullah would say, Inna Allah yasha an yarahunna sabaya. Allah wishes to see them captive. He comes out of unconsciousness. He goes to a hidden grave, the grave of Fatima to Zahra. He gives his last farewell from a Zahra until the caravan leaves Medina. A time comes waqafa for Rasul Hussein. Hussein's horse doesn't go any further. Hussein comes off the horse. He calls the people from the surrounding area. People of Banu Asad come forward. He says, Masmuha Dhil Ard. What is the name of this place? Someone would say, Sayyidi Ismuha Tayyaf. This is called Tav. He would say, Alaha Ismun Akhayayar. Does it have another name? Someone would say, Sayyidi Ismuha Ghadiriyat. He would continue asking. Someone would say, Shatul Furat. One of the elders from Banu Asad then is brought. Hussein says, What is the name of this land? He would say, Sayyidi Ismuha. Karbala Hussein says Fiha Karbun Wabala This is my resting place He buys the land from Banu Azad They set up their tents And Hussein would tell Banu Azad I buy this land from you But I have two requests One is when my followers come to visit my grave take care of my followers what was the second request of Abba Abdullah 
was saying would say if you see any bodies on the ground that haven't been buried if you can bury these bodies they enter into Karbala where Tor Zainab comes to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Zainab says when will we leave this place Hussein says why Zainab we have just got here she would say as soon as we have entered my heart is restless Hussein would say this is the place that I would fall and this is the place where Zainul Abidin would see atrocity after atrocity would see his own father covered in spears for we're told when Zainul Abidin leaves Karbala and he would be passing by in Medina. Someone would have left a slaughtered animal in front of Zainul Abideen. Sajjad would come and say, Can I ask you three questions? He would say, Yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. He says, The first is, Did you give this animal water? He says, Yes, Ya Ibn Rasul. He says the second when you were slaughtering it Where were the family of this goat? He says I hid them away from this animal He said and when your neck was on When your knife was on the neck of this animal Did you speed up the killing or slow it down? He said Rasul ibn Rasulullah would speed up the killing Hussein turns to Karbala he says Walakin yawm al-ashir min al-muharram Hussein was killed thirsty I and Zainab and Ummul Kulthum were watching and when Shimmer's knife was on the neck of Hussein, he did not speed up the killing, rather he slowed down the killing of my father. <laughs> وسيعلم الذين ذلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون يحسن